I hope that you have been as excited as I am with this series that we are in called The Unshakables. This is a really good series that I think really hits some of the truths of who we are in Christ, the unshakable life that we have. And so for the past five weeks, we've been talking about some of these things in the unshakable life. One of them being the, the unshakable life knows its place in God's story. And Alex talked about that, that acronym for the gospel of God, our sins, paying everyone life. We talked about the unshakable life, living to surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Phil teaching us that, that you know, we're quick to acknowledge that Jesus is our Savior, but we're not so quick to acknowledge him as Lord, as the maker, as our ruler, as our master. Alex talked about the unshakable life being a lifestyle of repentance and remembering when we're, we're walking towards our sin and we're not following who Jesus is, but we repent. And we do a 180 and we, we start to walk in the other direction towards Christ. That motion of repentance. Alex talked about the unshakable life being empowered by Holy Spirit for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom. You have that power within you when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And then last week, Tyler nailed it with the unshakable life both satisfying and being hungry for God's word. And so what I'd like to do right now before we get started in our next topic is I want you to take a look at those five topics of the unshakable life. And I want you to think about, is there one of those that really has impacted you more than another these past five weeks? Is there one up there that just really hits you hard? Maybe it's one of those that you're doing very well in. Maybe it's one of those that you'd like to do a little bit better in, to have a little bit more understanding and application of that. So I want you to think about that right now. Which one of these has impacted you the most in the last five weeks? And so what I'd like you to do then woo, is find someone right beside you, turn to someone right beside you, and share which one of these has impacted you the most. Go ahead. come back together here. I hope that tonight has a, just a, more, a, a powerful effect as the last five weeks. I hope that tonight impacts you in a way that is going to drive you closer to Christ. And if you do not know him yet, I'm, I'm praying that this message tonight is going to put something on your heart to really start questioning and really start thinking and really start understanding who Jesus Christ is. Because tonight we're going to be talking about the unshakable family. And so the unshakable life is a life that is committed to the family of God. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. When I think of family, I think of a family tree. Has anybody ever taken the time to research your family tree, to research the lineage of your ancestors and those that have come before you? Um, I've done that. My father's side, there's a gentleman up here on the left on my father's side, the picture beside him, I am not related to Mel Gibson, but Mel Gibson played this, this character in the movie Braveheart. Sir William Wallace is on my father's side of my, my lineage. On my mother's side is this gentleman in the upper right-hand corner. He was a founder of the United States. He was a, a firm believer in, in developing this document called the Constitution of the United States. He was the, the creator of our entire United States banking system. It's Alexander Hamilton. Down here in the bottom left is my lineage below me, okay, those who have come after, my wife, Virginia, my four kids, Morgan, Zach, Abby, and Taylor. Taylor is in the house. Taylor, where are you? Woo, Tay-Tay. Part of my family tree. But tonight, we're not, we're not going to be talking about that type of family. We're not going to be talking about our blood family. We're going to be talking about something like this bottom right-hand picture. This bottom right-hand picture, some of these people in here are part of my family. They are part of my spiritual family. They are part of God's family. And that's going to be our focus tonight, to really understand what the family of God is, what it is, why God put it into practice, and then how as a family we should be operating together. 
And so when I think of these family trees, I had the opportunity with my family to visit this place, this tree. It's called the Angel Oak. And as I was thinking about this family tree and I was thinking about something to really symbolize God's family, I thought of this Angel Oak. This angel oak is located near Charleston, South Carolina. It's estimated to be, at the minimal, 500 years old, at the least. Some some estimates have it going as far back as 1,500 years. It's the oldest tree east of the Mississippi River. This tree is so ginormous, okay, its height is 67 feet tall. 67 feet tall. That's about 11 or 12 of me standing on top of each other. This tree has a diameter of 9 feet, the trunk. My arm span here is 6 feet. Add 3 feet and you have the diameter of this trunk of this tree. The longest branch on this tree, okay, from tip to tip, the longest branch measures 187 feet That is 62 yards. Think of a football field, 62 yards. That's the longest branch coming off this tree. It's actually the one you see there at the bottom right, that big one. This tree produces a shade. It's so ginormous, it produces a shade of more than half an acre of land. And this tree being five, at least 500 years old, it has endured the American Revolutionary War, troops coming through this area. It has endured the Civil War, troops coming through this area. It has endured multiple hurricanes. It has endured disease. It has endured vandalism. This tree is unshakable. This tree has withstood 500 plus years of standing and surviving. It's truly unshakable, and it's truly a symbol for what the family of God is all about. So we're going to be talking about, there's another picture, this is a picture that I took. Everything you see in that picture is part of this tree. It looks like there's another tree there to the left, but at the top left is, but the left side of that tree, that's still part of this tree. It's huge. It's gigantic. Okay, It's, it's really, it's beautiful. So tonight when we look at family, we're going to look at this acronym, and this is going to be a way for you to remember what the family of God is, why God instituted the family of God, and how it's supposed to operate. It's having an understanding of the foundation of Jesus Christ and the faith in Jesus Christ with fellowship with all members of this family with the sole purpose of increasing our relationship with Christ by loving God, loving others, and yielding to God and others. And as we go through tonight, you're going to see the parts of this acronym playing out in what the family of God is, why God instituted it, and how it's supposed to operate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are a great and mighty God, that you Um, have given us your son, Jesus Christ, as a firm foundation that we can rely on, that we can stand on, that we can trust in, that we can have faith in, that we can be called members of your family. I thank you so much for that privilege, for that promise. And Lord, I just pray tonight that our hearts would be not only challenged, but also, Lord, that you would just humble our hearts to hear what your word has to say. And Lord, that we can understand what it means to be a part of the family of God. In Jesus' name, amen. And so when we're looking at this, this what, this why, and this how, it really ties back to the entire vision of our student ministries. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody can recite that. We haven't really gone over what our vision here is in a, in a long time. But our vision is to come alive to the love of Jesus, become rooted in the truth of Jesus and tell the world about the grace grace of Jesus. And the series that we're in with Unshakable Lies is we're really really focusing on that tell the world. And so as you're listening tonight as to what the family of God is and why it was instituted and how it's to operate, that how is critical. Because that's what the message is that you're sending to the world. 
And so we're going to come alive into God's family through our foundation and faith <clears throat> and through all members. We're going to start with Ephesians 2 tonight. Um, I'm going to, we're, it's going to be difficult really to open up our Bibles. If you have them, you can turn to it, feel free to turn to it. But we're going to be coming out of three different, three different places in the Bible. And the first one is from Ephesians 2. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in the dwelling place for God. This family of God, let's define it. The family of God, becoming a part of his family requires us to come alive to the love of Jesus. It requires us to take him in to understand who he is, to understand what he did for us, and personally invite him into our hearts. And you become a family of, part of the family of God. You see, it's going back to that story that Alex shared with us with the gospel of God, our sins, paying everyone life. Becoming a part of the family of God. It's accepting the fact that you have been created in God's image, but that you are broken and you are a sinful person. You are falling short of the glory of God because of our sin, and so God in his greatness, God in his ultimate love for you, sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to pay the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice, for you and for me, by shedding his blood on the cross. And then he, he defeats death. He rises from the dead. His resurrection, he defeats death. And what is the greatest gift that we can get is eternal life with him. When you understand that, when you take that story into your heart and you accept Jesus for who he is, for what he did. It's the, it, it's the greatest decision that you can make, but it's, it's the reality that you have to understand who he is and what he did and accept him into your life as Lord and Savior and surrender everything to him. That's when you become the family of God and part of that family of God. I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. First of all, every single one of us in this room tonight has been created in the image of God. You have been, been created by our creator, God Almighty, and you were created in his image. Every single one of us was created. But not every single one of us is a part of the family of God. You see, to be a part of that family of God, you have to have Jesus in your heart and accept him as Lord and Savior. The unshakable life is grounded, is rooted, and has a firm foundation in Jesus Christ for all those who have faith in him, becoming a member of God's family. So I go back to this angel oak and the symbolism that it portrays. And we look at that nine-foot diameter trunk this ginormous trunk holding these branches. And something about an oak tree that you might not know is the root system of an oak tree is usually about double the size of the height of the tree. And so this tree that is 67 feet tall, the root system is probably about 120 feet down into the ground. This nine-foot diameter trunk and root system of 120 feet is the life of this tree, it's what, brings the, it's what satisfies the needs of the tree. It's what gives the nutrients to the tree. It's what brings the water supply up to the tree for its survival. It's what allows it to be grounded when those storms come and those hardships come. It's what keeps it being unshakable. And that foundation, that trunk, that is Jesus Christ in your life. That is Jesus Christ to the family of God. 
And so I want, what I want you to do right now, if you all just kind of bow your heads and close your eyes, I want you to think about what that foundation is. I want you to think about, do you fully trust in that foundation? Do you fully trust in who Jesus Christ is? And if you don't, are you willing to try to understand? And so again, you can look up here again at this this tree. The strength of this tree is found in that trunk and those roots. And that's what Jesus Christ is to our family. And so I'd like to do something, Phil says it's a little tacky, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'd like you to participate because I'm going to give you a visual of how you can remember what the family of God is, why it's instituted, and how it operates. And so everybody, take your right hand, make a fist. You know, our, our culture, we're, we're in a culture now that we have to have some kind of symbol to show, right? So this is going to be our symbol for the family of God. Plant your tree. Plant your tree. This is the foundation of the family of God. It is Jesus Christ, the foundation in him. It's our faith in him to give it some branches. Give it some branches, two branches right here. All members. All members who have accepted him as Lord and Savior have now become a part of the family of God. You become a part of the family of God. We'll move on to our second point tonight. The third, uh, the third letter in our acronym, the I, the increasing, this is becoming rooted in, into God's family. This is, this is the why. This is why did God institute the family? Why did God put this into place in his kingdom? In Hebrews, we see, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, when we come to accept Christ, when, when all these people start to accept him as Lord and Savior, and we get all these branches, and more branches are sprouting out, and more branches are growing, some bigger than others, some have been in the family longer than others. But we see this happening. God has developed this with a purpose in mind, and his purpose is these family members... These family members need to have fellowship with one another with the sole purpose of increasing their relationship in who he is. To have fellowship with each other. And there's three, there's, there's three verbs in here that we're going to focus on, on God's purpose, why he created this family. First is stir up. Stir up one another to love. Anybody here ever stir something up, stir a soup up, stir hot chocolate up, stir some coffee up? I don't know what it is, right? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a motion that you make that it gets things moving, right? Well, that's, that's what this is saying, to stir up. You, we, we are called as a, as a family to get things stirred up, to provoke one another to love. And that is key. We are to provoke, we are to stir up one another to love. How are you doing with that? If you're in the family of God tonight, if you're sitting here tonight and you can say that I am part of God's family, how are you doing with that? How are you stirring up family members to love in a world where people just hate each other? How are you doing? The next thing we're going to look at is this meeting together. God instituted this family with the sole purpose of us to have fellowship with one another, to meet together. And that meeting together, you, you, have, you have the choice of groups that you meet with. You can, you can meet and gather with God's family members, or you can meet and gather with non-believers. And the one that you choose is going to be the one that influences you the most. This one over here of non-believers... You're going to be influenced to the world's values, to the world's moral, um, yeah, morals. Okay, you're going to be you're going to be inf- influenced as to what the world is telling you to do. You have the choice to be 
influenced by God's family. And this meeting together is not just coming here Wednesday nights. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're, you've come to fellowship with one another here. But what this is saying is you, this needs to happen on a daily occurrence. This needs to be a practice put into place where we're interacting face to face. We're communicating face to face. Not on technology, face to face. It's truly interacting and having a relationship, having a fellowship with your family members of God. And that's how you're going to grow because the purpose of the family of God is to increase our relationship with him. So my question for you in here is, who are you meeting with the majority of your time? Members of God's family or members of the world? The final one in here, I think, is the one that's probably the most impactful. It's probably the one that I'm going to admit to myself that I try to be good at this, but I'm not as good as what God has intended. It's this idea of encouraging one another. Students, I want you to think, and I want you to be really honest with yourself. When is the last time that you spoke words to a friend or a family member with the sole purpose of encouraging them and building them up? I'm going to ask that question again. When is the last time that you purposefully, purposefully gave words of encouragement to someone in the, in the sole idea of building them up? Can you imagine if that not only happened in the family of God, but if that happened in the world, could you imagine if we were a people who gave words of encouragement? That was God's intent. His intent was for us to build each other up. Why? To increase our relationship in Jesus Christ. So why are we called to stir up? Why are we called to meet together? Why are we called to encourage one another? Again, it's because that purpose is to support each other when things are bad, when things are good. It's to support each other and all of our family members in Jesus to increase in love, to increase in our relationship with Jesus Christ, our connection to him, and to increase in our efforts to be more like him. So we'll look at this Angel Oak again. The one thing that the pictures on Google do, it does no justice to. You have to see this to really get the beauty of this tree. But the one thing you don't see in this Google picture is are these, these branches, there are so many branches on this tree, and some, some huge, some small, but there are branches that actually grow and bend, and they're actually supporting branches that are higher up. They grow and bend and intertwine and hold each other up to keep each other from shaking, to keep each other from breaking, to keep each other from falling over. And the other amazing thing is about this tree that you don't see in the pictures, there's actually wire cables that humans have put into place to hold the branches together, to support each other. Because when those winds come, when those damaging winds come, when those storms come, The trees work in harmony, the branches work in harmony together with one another to support each other in those winds. And that's the image of God's family. All connected to this trunk, this source, Jesus Christ. In unity and harmony with each other, those branches supporting each other. Why? To increase the relationship with Jesus Christ. So you ready to be tacky again? Ready? Let's plant our tree. Foundation. Foundation in faith. Fellowship with all members for the sole purpose of increasing our relationship with Christ. We point our eyes to our Lord. Foundation. Faith. All members increasing. And so we finally get to the how. How does... How does this look? 
We're telling the world about God's family through loving and yielding. <clears throat> and debated whether I should talk about this at the beginning or talk about it now, but we're going to talk about it now. We're going to do a little reality check because I'm not naive to think that a lot of you out there, inclu- including myself, <clears throat> have been hurt by a family member. And let's talk about blood family first. Let's talk about our, our, our blood relatives. I know that there is a lot of hurting and pain, myself included. There have been family members who have hurt me, who have said things to me that hurt me. There have been actions that have been made, whether it's from our parents, our siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, you, you name it. And some of us have this negative view. We have this negative perception of family, and we're like, if, if God's family is like what my family is, I want no part of it. Somebody feel like that? Like that? Well, you know, the same, same is true with God's family. You know, there, there have been people in God's family who have hurt me, have said things against me that made me feel bad, that made me hurt inside. And you might have that experience too. And, and again, it, it, gives us, it, it can give us this picture of if this is what the God's family is, I don't want to be a part of it. But I want you to understand, that was not God's intent. And I want to share with you something that, since I accepted Christ at 22 years old, I'm now 43, something that I've just really comprehended recently, and really trying to force myself to understand, because when you live this many years, and have this many pains and hardships that you've gone through, sometimes it's hard to come out of that. And so this is what I want you to hear, something of what I have done to really try to understand this family. You see, when I sin, when I commit hurt against someone else, I find it very easy. I find it very easy to say to myself, I'm broken, I'm a sinful man, I have grace of God. Find it very easy. But if someone hurts me, if someone comes against me, if someone puts pain into my heart, I am not easy to remember that they are broken too. They are in need of the grace of God just as much as me. And so I challenge you to think about your past hurts. I challenge you to think about the moments and the moment when you are being hurt by a family member, by a blood family member, by a family member of God. I want you to really comprehend and remember we're all broken. It's not God's intent. Romans 3.23, for, for all have, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't say, for Greg has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. It doesn't say, for you have, fall, have sinned. It says, all have sinned. We are all sinners. We are all broken. It wasn't God's intent. But God fixed it with his son. And so how should the family members of God, what, it, what was God's intent? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. You see, our, our sin and our brokenness, see, see, God, when he created us, he wanted fellowship with us. He wanted to be with us. But sin entered the world. We sin and we broke, and, and, and this fellowship, this communion we have with, with God is separated. And so what does God do? He sends his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins, to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, and And what does that do? His purpose was to reconcile. His purpose was to restore his fellowship and relationship with us. God did that for you. You don't have to do it. 
He did that for you by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And when you accept him as Lord and Savior, you have restored and reconciled your relationship with him. And so that applies to the family of God. You as, you as members of God's family are called to do the same thing with each other. You're called to restore, to reconcile broken relationships that you have, even with those who've hurt you. And I can tell you there is no greater feeling than going to someone that has hurt you in the past and acknowledging that they too are broken and that you forgive them, tears flow. Reconciliation happens. And the way that God has intended our family to operate has just occurred. So I ask you, what, some, what relationships do you need to restore? What are some relationships that you need to reconcile so that fellowship among the family members of God can be restored? So God, how, does, how should we represent ourselves? How do we tell the world about God's family and how we act? It says families, the family of believers who love unconditionally and act in humility toward each other. Yielding to God. You see, God loves you unconditionally. No matter your sins, if you have accepted him as Lord and Savior, he loves you con- unconditionally to the point of death. And he has called us to do the same for each other. Do you know what love, loving unconditionally means? It means, and I've said this before, but loving unconditionally means you love without reservation. You hold nothing back. You love without hesitation. You just go and do it. You put everything else aside and you love. It's loving others without expectate, putting any expectations, putting any limitations on them. You just love. It's loving those who hurt you. It's loving those who disappoint you. It's loving those who come against you. It's loving people in the name of Jesus, unconditionally. Imagine what kind of country this would be if people did that. Imagine what God's family could do if we did that here. And loving unconditionally can only happen, it can only happen if you humble yourself. This word yielding, I want you to think about um, coming, on, com- coming on to the Interstate 83 and you're coming on an entrance ramp, right? And you come up and some, of you, some people don't do this and they make me very angry when they don't yield. But there's that yield sign, right? What does a yield sign mean? It means slow down for what? For others to go. When you yield in the family of God, you are humbling yourself to the point where others are more important than you. And when you do that, when you humble yourself before somebody and you make them greater than you, that's when you're going to be able to love them unconditionally. And that's what God has intended for us to do. So I look at this tree, and I made it black and white for a purpose, because, you know, in this series, we talked about the seasons of change, right? Do you remember that that message? I forget which message it was in, but we talked about that seasons of change and where we are, right? This tree doesn't always look beautiful. This tree goes through seasons of change. In the wintertime, in fact, this, this tree looks like it's dead. The same is true for the family of God. The same is true for you and me who are part of this family of God. We go through seasons of change. There's moments where we look dead. But the truth is that we're still connected to this source of life, and it's Jesus Christ. And when this tree manages to withstand the winds, to withstand the things that come against it, to work together in harmony and unity with each other, relying on that source of Jesus Christ, when that happens, it survives and is unshakable. And it blooms again. The 
So let's make our foundation with all members, having fellowship with each other, with the sole purpose of increasing our relationship with Christ. And that, that leaves us with two more branches. And the reason we're going to keep those branches down is because it symbolizes a yielding. It symbolizes a humbling. And we're left with the universal sign of I love you. And this is the family of God, students. This is what the world needs to see in the family of God. This is the symbol. This is the action it needs to see. I love you. I love you. Because God loves you. Shakeable life it commits to the family of God. It's an understanding of a foundation and a faith, a fellowship with all members, increasing the relationship in Jesus Christ, the sole purpose of loving and yielding to God and to others. And so I'm going to call our, all of our leaders to the front, all the leaders, if you come up here to the front real quick. I want you to see a true representation of what the family of God looks like. Students, I present to you my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm proud to call them my brothers and sisters in Christ because they are part of my family. They are part of this family of God. Why? Because they have a firm foundation in who Jesus Christ is. They have a firm foundation of what he did on the cross, of who he is. They've accepted him as Lord and Savior of their lives to rule, to reign, to save. Having fellowship with each other as members of God's family with the sole purpose of increasing our relationship in Christ and helping to increase your relationship with Christ by loving and yielding to him, to ourselves, and to you. You have before you, if you are part of this family, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are part of this family. If you're not, you're still welcome here, and we're going to love you just the same. And I just pray that if you're not part of this family yet, I pray that something in your heart comes alive. I pray that your eyes are open, your heart becomes open to the truth of what Jesus Christ did for you. It is the most amazing thing that could ever happen in your life by accepting him as Lord and, as Lord and Savior. To become a part of this great family. And so in a week... We're going to have one epic weekend, aren't we? Who's excited? Yeah, I'm excited. If you're, if you're coming to that weekend, I can, I can assure you 100% that these members of the family of God are going to love you well. They're going to humble themselves before you to serve you, to help to increase your relationship in Jesus Christ so that you are founded and that you have faith in the one who came to save you. And so I want to take this time to pray. I want to take this time to pray over our leaders. I want to take this time to pray over you. I want to take this time to pray over one epic weekend where lives are saved, where hearts are changed, where we come together in fellowship with one another with the sole purpose of increasing our relationship in Christ. Heavenly Father, you are the great I am. You are God Almighty, you are majesty, you are king. And I pray in your son's name.